Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because thus far you have led us in this workers retreat. We thank you for what we have heard already from your word. And we thank you for the prayers we have prayed and for your response to our prayers. Father, we pray that you continue with us as we continue even now in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see. Touch our hearts to understand. Mold our will to be willing to do what you want us to do. That at the end of it all, we look back and rejoice that your purpose has been carried out in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. In this session now, we come to the timeless, important topic of trials and temptations of saints. Timeless, because in every generation, those who follow God have always faced temptation and trials. Timeless, because in the generation in which we live now, Temptations and trials are still there to check up what kind of people we are. Timeless because even in the future, until we pass from this veil of death and shadow, these temptations and trials will continue to test and to see of what kind of stuff we are made spiritually. And very important, because the outcome of the temptation and the trial will determine where we will be now. Whether we will be in the favor, in the pleasure of God, remaining in the kingdom of God. And where we will be in future, whether we will be separated forever from God and from the people of God, or we will be with God. So then, this timeless and important message, temptations and trials of saints, is what is arresting our attention now. Born as sinners, God makes provision that we can become the saints of God. And we have to settle, first of all, to realize that we have become saints, that through the process and through the grace of God, and through that conversion experience, we have been turned from sinners unto saints. You know this already, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If everybody had sinned, and everybody had come short of the glory of God, how was it that some are being called the saints of God? These were the people who realized they were sinners, and they came to confess their sins unto the Lord. And as a result of that confession and forsaking of their sins, their sins were forgiven. As a result of that forgiveness, their names changed. They were no more sinners, but now they have become fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Or they have become disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Or they have become the regenerate, that is, those who are regenerated and those who have been forgiven. They have become the saints of God. In Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Looking at verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me. By sacrifice. These are the people that are called saints. Those that have made sacrifice with God. God, 
by sacrifice. Sorry, they have made covenant with God by sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it was the sacrifice of an animal. Because that was what God ordained. That somebody felt he was a sinner. He knew the judgment of God. He knew the wrath of God upon him as a sinner. He will bring a sacrifice. Confess his sins. And then slaughter that animal. The animal became his substitute to take away the guilt of sin. And to take away all the pollution of sin. That now he will say he was free. As we come on to the New Testament, the sacrifice is a higher sacrifice. A greater sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are taken away. One, the penalty of sin is removed. You will not come to condemnation again. You are passed from death unto life. Not only that, you have peace with God now. Because being justified by faith, you have peace with God. Two, not only that the penalty has been removed, the pollution, the dirt, and the guilty feeling, everything has been removed too. Not only that the power of sin is broken. And as this power of sin is broken, you have genuine salvation. And it is this genuine salvation that makes you to live free from sin. You become a saint of God. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. In Psalm 37. From verse 27 to verse 30. Depart from evil and do good. And dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth justice, judgment. And forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. It says in verse 28 that God does not forsake his saints. Who are these saints? Verse 27, those who have departed from evil. Who are these saints? Verse 27. Those who have received grace to do good. Who are these saints? Verse 27. Those who now dwell in the presence of God. And they have the consecration and commitment. They intend dwelling in the presence of God forever. Who are these saints? In verse 28. They are the people who have got the power to be preserved in righteous relationship with the Lord. Who are these saints? Verse 28. They are the people that are different from the wicked that shall be cut off. Who are these saints? The righteous that shall inherit the land according to the promise of God. Who are these saints? They are the people that their language, their conversations have, been, have even changed. And you find that the mouths of these saints, righteous people, speak wisdom. And their tongue talk of the judgment, the justice of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be saints, these are the people that have received the call of God out of darkness into light. Come unto me, they have heard. All ye that labor on a heavy laden, I will give you rest. And they have responded to that call of God. And as they come into the kingdom of God, they are told, the call is not an ordinary call. The call is not an ordinary call to make you live in an ordinary manner. Now you are called to be saints. Live like a saint. How does a saint live? In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Be ye followers of God as their children and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us 
and has given himself for us an opening and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smiling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become saints. How do saints live? They live righteously. How do saints live? They live like dear children of God, following after the example and the life of God. How do saints live? They walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. How do saints live? They live free from fornication, free from uncleanness, free from covetousness, free from adultery, free from sin. That is the life that befits or becomes a saint of God. To move from being a sinner to being a saint, we need conversion. Once somebody has been a sinner, but now is a saint, what has taken place in his life is that there has been a conversion. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore, and be ye converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Those who are called saints are those who have been converted from being sinners to being new creatures. And this conversion means that their sins have been confessed by them, forsaken by them, therefore blotted out by God. And a time of refreshing is now to come unto them from the presence of the Lord. James chapter 5 verse 19 and verse 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. It's not only the sinner that has never known the Lord, never known the gospel, never known the church, never seen the Bible that needs conversion. If one of us, one of us brethren, one of us children of God, one of us who have been called by the name of God, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, if any of us has gone away from the truth, in his own life, he has deviated from the truth. In his marriage, he has deviated from the truth. In his conduct, he has deviated from the truth. In his marketing and in his business, he has deviated from the truth. In relationship, in association, he has deviated from the truth. Or in his manner of lifestyle, appearance, or dressing, he has deviated from the truth. If any of you err from the truth, in his preaching, in his presentation, in his belief, he has deviated from the truth. If any of you err from the truth, and one convert him. Do you know that he needs conversion? That a backslider needs to be turned to God again. It says, let him know. That he that he which converted the sinner. Remember in verse 19, is called one of us. Is called a believer. Is called one of the brethren. But then the moment he deviated from the truth, he became a sinner. And when the word of God comes to him now, and now he repents all over again and confesses all over again and forsakes all the sins once over, once over again, he says, God, I'm sorry, I know I've gone astray. Now what happens now, we are told, he that converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. It is this restoration that saves him from the second death. If he doesn't repent, after backsliding, is going to die. And if he dies in sin, is going to suffer forever and ever and shall hide a multitude of sins. In Acts chapter 26 and in verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness and forgiveness of sins and inheritance 
among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Conversion then takes us from darkness to light. It takes us from evil and sin to righteousness. Conversion brings us from the way of hell to the way of heaven. Conversion is what takes us away from the way of the world to the way of the cross. From Satan to Christ the Savior. Conversion takes Satan's slave away from him. This sinner has been a slave of the devil. Conversion takes this slave and tells Satan, this is not your slave anymore. He wants to follow the Lord. Conversion takes Satan's property from him. You see, Satan has been laying hold, laying claim to the sinner, saying, he belongs to me completely. But when conversion takes place, he is turned from the power of Satan unto God. He is taken away from darkness, is brought into the light. So actually, conversion deprives the devil of his slave, of his servant, of his property. What then will Satan do, knowing that he has lost a slave? Knowing that the one that had been serving him before is now gone away from him. This is what brings temptation and trial. The devil will endeavor by means of temptations and trials to bring that saint, that child of God, that one who has been taken away from the hands of the devil, to come back to the devil and to come back to perdition and punishment. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11 from verse 24, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, Seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return unto mine house. Whence I came out, here is the devil, here is the demon, the evil spirit, laying claim to this individual as his house. And he said, this unclean spirit had gone out of the man. But then, find, wanting to have rest and seeking rest, finding none, he says, I will return. I will return to my house. Whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth his swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh unto him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. That is, Satan wanting to regain entry into that life again. Isn't that what you find illustrated in Exodus chapter 14? After Pharaoh had let the people go, had released those slaves, eventually he questioned and said, what have we done? Why have we allowed the people to go? And so began trial for the children of Israel. In Pharaoh trying to reclaim, trying to repossess the people once again. Exodus chapter 14, from verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from being our slaves? From being our servants. That's exactly the attitude of the devil. When a soul has been converted. Turned from sin unto righteousness. He says, why have we let this individual go? Why have we released him to Christ? Why have we allowed him to take that decision to become a Christian? Why have we allowed him to become a child of God, a pilgrim on the way to heaven rather than a candidate of hell. And in verse 6, and he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. His intention was to make sure that he brought the people back. 
And this is the intention of the devil whenever he brings temptation. The purpose of the tempter is to reoccupy his old house. To reoccupy his old house. The purpose of the tempter of the devil is to repossess a slave or to bring the saint back, back to sin, back to evil, back to darkness, back to bondage, back to perdition. We consider three points in the message. Number one, temptations and trials from Satan. Temptations and trials from Satan. Number two, consequence of failure and falling. Consequence of failure and falling. Number three, the triumph and reward of faithful pilgrims. The triumph and reward of faithful pilgrims. Temptations and trials from Satan. We must understand that temptations come from Satan. In James chapter 1, from verse 13. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Here we have the Definition of temptation. That temptations are enticements from Satan to appeal to our flesh, to appeal to our weakness, to appeal to our desires and needs and problems, and thereby, if he can, make us fall and turn away from God. A temptation is an enticement from the devil. To appeal to your flesh, appeal to your weakness, appeal to the secret desires in your life, appeal to your needs and appeal to your problems, and thereby, if you can, turn you away from God, make you to fall. Look at James chapter 1 verse 13 again, let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Let no man say, when he is tempted... Well, maybe God doesn't want me to get to heaven after all. Maybe it was because I just forced myself into the kingdom of God. I repented and called on the Lord. Maybe actually God doesn't even want me to have any kind of relationship with him. I'm, I'm the only one that is just making an effort wanting to serve the Lord. Maybe I'm not one of those people that are predestined to be a child of God. And so God now has brought this temptation to me so that God will say, there you are now because you are falling. I'm not going to take you to heaven again. He says temptation is not from God. Temptation to evil. Enticement to evil. Invitation to commit sin. is not coming from God. And so you cannot say when temptation comes, well, you say, well, the will of the Lord be done. Well, the will of the Lord is that you live a victorious life. When temptation comes your way, you cannot say, well, I don't know what God wants. I don't know whether he wants me to yield to this. I don't know the intention of God in bringing this temptation to me. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Neither tempted he any man. Then in verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lost and enticed. What the Bible is saying here is that there is something within every individual. It is called lost, or it is called desire, 
or it is called ambition, or it is called a wish. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I wish I were there. I wish I were here. It is that thing from within, like a magnet within. If that magnet is not insulated, if that magnet is not a kind of preserve so that it doesn't draw all these things from outside, you will find that you are drawn away, drawn away of your own lust and enticed. And enticed. The devil begins to make you hear that kind of music. And there is something within you that wants it. That relishes it. That wants to enjoy it. Then you are drawn away and enticed. The devil makes you to see a particular object. And there is something within desiring it. Wanting it. I wish it were mine. And you are drawn away of your own desire. And you are enticed. The devil makes you to hear of a particular company, of a particular trade, of a particular possession. And then you wish, you say, I wish I possessed it. I wish I had it. And you are drawn away. There's a thing within you that when you hear that thing, you see that thing, you feel that thing, or you experience that thing, you are drawn away and enticed. And enticed. Then it says, when lost as conceived. When lost as conceived. This is using a pictorial language. That you can make that lost to be barren. You can make that lost not to be fed with what the lost is looking for. And then when that temptation comes, that enticement comes, that drawing away comes, you starve that thing. You do not allow the loss or the desire or the drawing from within to be in contact with that thing. You stop it. You don't allow it to get conceived. But then it says, if you will feed on that thing, if you keep on looking at that thing, if you keep on thinking about that thing, if you keep on desiring that thing, if you keep on examining that thing, can't I have it? What is wrong in it after all? Are all the Christians not doing it? Is it as bad as I'm thinking about? Will this take me from the kingdom of God? Can't I do it and still retain my position in the kingdom of God? Then you are drawn away and lost as conceived. Then eventually if it's conceived, it's going to bring forth something. Is going to bring forth a result. The child of temptation is sin. And the child is going to come eventually. It bring forth, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see, when temptation comes, temptation is not sin in itself. When temptation has come, you have not committed sin. But then it is when you have been drawn away by your lust and you are enticed and you give in and eventually you do that thing, you take that thing, you go that place or you put on that thing, eventually you are yielding to the temptation and it becomes sin. In Joshua chapter 7, from verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, Give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession unto him. And tell him now, what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. I want you to now see the illustration of what we read in James chapter 1. One, we read that God does not bring this kind of temptation to any man. We have read that God desires all of us to remain in the kingdom of God. And when this temptation to evil comes, it is not God that has brought it unto us. Not only that, we have read that when temptation comes, we are drawn, we are enticed of our own lust. And eventually it is conceived and it brings forth sin. And sin brings forth See the processes here. From the beginning of the chapter, we are told that God was unhappy with the children of Israel. 
And he told Joshua that the children of Israel have sinned and because of that he will no, no more be with them. Telling us that the temptation was not brought by God. It wasn't the work of God. It came from another source. And now being drawn away. Look at verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight then I coveted here he can say I saw that thing no doubt it is possible that many other Israelites saw that too because you see they won the battlefield and when all these people in Jericho when they died as the wall came down there were many Babylonish garments everybody could have seen that wasn't the problem. And as we are here, we see many things in the places of war. We hear many things from many, many people. And there are many suggestions that are given by unbelievers. Why not try this? Why not try that? Many people hear many things. Hearing is not the problem. Seeing is not the problem. But then, when I saw among the spoils, that is among the results and the booties of the war, a goodly Babylonish garment Babylonish garment not Israelitish garment Babylonish garment goodly Babylonish garment so these Babylonians are so talented are so colorful that they can do all this embroidery upon a kind of cloth I saw it and I said these Babylonish people so they are beautiful things like this goodly things like this and then I began to look at what I was wearing as an Israelite. And I said, ah, ah, even these Babylonians, they have something better than we Israelites. And then he said, I also saw 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. Then he said, I coveted. There was something in me that I was having the desire that said, I think I need this. I think there's something in me that wants this. I think there's something in me that will appreciate this. I don't think I will be happy without this. I think this thing will contribute to my joy, to my happiness. You see, he's been drawn away and being enticed because of his desires. I said temptation is something that comes, that appeals to your flesh, appeals to your eyes, appeals to your taste appeals to your weakness appeals to your desires and needs and problems and then he said i coveted them and then he said eventually i took them i took them sin was getting conceived in the coveting and eventually sin was born as he took them and he says behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now as an Israelite, really there was no occasion for him to wear that Babylonish garment. Because if he did, everybody will know. He will die for it. He took it and he couldn't use it. Do you know the people that steal and they cannot even spend the money? Do you know the people that will take something? Here we are now, for example, you see somebody that has a large, big Bible. And they ask you, maybe the people, the person went to the uh, kitchen to bring something. And before the fellow came back, you have been looking at that Bible. And then you touched it and then you opened it. And you saw that the lettering and the center references, uh -uh, I've never seen like this before. And then you opened and you saw some colorful pictures in that Bible. You say, uh -uh, this one is wonderful. You say, what am I going to do? So the fellow came back while you are looking at it. They say, now, uh, bring the food down, bring the food down. The fellow was coming, so you close the Bible and look the other direction. And while we're looking for other things, the fellow went again to uh, go and get maybe water or something. Then you say, ah, this Bible. Even the letter, even the color, even everything that I see there. And then you opened it again, and when you opened it, you saw a particular page there. They say, who gave you, and to whom was it given, on what date, and the date of father, the day of the, uh, you know, the mother, the name of mother, the name of son-in-law, the name of father. They put all these things. My Bible doesn't have this kind of thing. And the fellow was coming again, you closed it. And now your heart has been saying, now, where did they even get this kind of Bible? Even if I have the money to buy it, where will I buy it? 
how can I have this thing? And while the fellow was bringing water again, you closed it and looked the other direction. And then eventually now they said, pack all these place and pack all these bowls and take them back to the kitchen. And so the fellow being, you know, eager to serve the Lord, he just, you know, packed all the things. And while he went away, then you looked at the end of it. They said that these are the subjects index and these are the concordance. say, what? Any verse you are looking for, you just open that part of it. You said, this is a Bible. Let me help myself. Maybe this is why I came to work as retreat to discover something like this. And then you took it and then you left that place and go and sit at the back. And the fellow came back and while the fellow came back looking for his wife, I said, rise up, let us pray so the fellow could not shout. He just rose up and we prayed and while I was preaching, he kept quiet but he's looking for his Bible. And then you go and hide it under. You cannot use it at the retreat here because... The person that has it may see it and say, ah, where did you get uh, this kind of Bible? Let me see the name there. So you hide it. You take it, but you cannot use it. If you take it to the district, since we know you that you are like a new combat, and we know the you know, little uh, six naira Bible you have been using all these years, and then you now come with a big Bible that a primary school child will need to carry on the head, we say, ah, where did you see this load? You will not be able to use it. And therefore, Achan, the same thing. Achan took everything and he hid it in the tent. Why do people steal when they cannot even wear the Babylonish garment? Why do people steal when they cannot even benefit from what they are doing? You know, the people that uh, covet things and want to take things and want to go into sin, and yet they do not have the time. They're almost dying. They're saying, when can I wear this Babylonish garment? When will I get the benefit of this sin that I've stolen? There is no chance. And yet to have committed sin in yielding to that temptation. And then eventually we're told that the man died the dead. Died the dead. Because... When sin is conceived, was the result? Death. Verse 25. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with souls and burnt them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones. That's temptation and that's yielding to temptation. Temptation comes from the devil to lead astray, to entice, to make you desire what is wrong. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, from verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flat tree of the tongue of a strange woman, Lost not her after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a warish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress shall will haunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go up on hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Here is talking of another kind of temptation. But once again, remember that temptation is an enticement from Satan. It can use anything. It can use anyone. But the temptation is enticement from Satan to appeal to your flesh, to appeal to your sight. To appeal to your weakness. To appeal to your desires. Every man, every woman has some desires. And these desires relate to various things in life. And the devil appeals to all these desires. And it says in verse 24. That women talking about women who tend. And women who yield themselves as instruments in the hands of the devil. Can use the flat tree of the tongue. The flat tree of the tongue. And if that is what you desire, you desire cheap praise. You desire cheap recognition. And you desire flattery. The devil is going to use that cheap praise and uh, cheap recognition and flattery. 
to make you go into what you shouldn't go into. It's lost not after her beauty in thine heart. Remember, please, that there's something in your own heart. Something in your own heart. That when you see an individual, and you will say, your own heart will say, the fellow is beautiful. Actually, beauty is relative. It depends on what you are looking at and the way you are looking at it. To one that is being enticed, this fellow looks beautiful. To another person who is not being enticed, the fellow is not beautiful. He's neither ugly nor beautiful, just a human being. And there is nothing in the heart that is drawing to an evil thing. But you see, when the temptation is very, very intense upon you, the one that is ugly will look beautiful. The one that is dirty, you know, that will not matter. Being dirty will not matter to you because of the temptation. So it says, lost not after her beauty in thine heart. And you see, as we go to our places of work, and as we go to the markets, and as we go in our various communities, we see a lot of women. In fact, you know, because of the un unemployment in this country right now, it appears that women try to make ends meet in various ways. And how do they do it? You know you how they do it because, you know, the ordinary salary they are getting in their places of work will not survive, will, will not get the job done. And so you will find a lot of these uh, women that they are the, you know, where there is a bus stop or where there is a corner somewhere or where there is uh, maybe a crossroad somewhere. You see them and that they are wearing their slacks and they are having their faces painted and everything there and they stand in there. And as they stand there, they beckon to the people or they smile to the people or they wave to the car owners. Or if you are not a car owner, you are just passing your way. Uh, they may just uh, ask you, uh, excuse me, sir, what's the time now? And as you are trying to answer what's the time now, makes space to you and tries to, you know, interest you and tries to say this and that. Or it may be that, you know, the lady with all the slacks and with all the shorts that they put on, and they stand, sometimes they stand two by two, or three by three, or they stand as individual in these various places, and say, excuse me, sir, uh, would you know the place to the street, so and so? Actually, they are not concerned about the street, they are concerned about you. And here you are, you try to answer that because you as a Christian, you like to be gentle. And as a Christian, you don't put two and two together. You don't reason at all. And, you, and since you know the street, you say, well, if you cross that way, and you cross that way, you will get to the place. And the lady is ready for another question. Um, if I cross that way, what do they call the street there? And if I'm going to turn to the other side, is that a lane or avenue or a crescent or I'm trying to remember a particular kind of uh, name, street I got from. So you see, this address I have, I'm trying to uh, get the place. And um, uh, I'm sorry to bother you and to impose myself on you, but can you take me to the place if you say it's just there? I've been, I've been in that place, you know, some five minutes ago. I said, I said, I said, and here you are, you are a Christian. And you like to go the extra mile. When Jesus said, if they take you a mile, go the extra mile, he, he wasn't telling you that if Satan takes you a mile, go the extra mile, never move, move a yard. An inch was the devil. That passage is not applicable to the devil. And never move an inch was the tentress. And you say, well, you live where you are going. Maybe you are going with a particular brother. Say, bro, uh, I will, you know, we have to do good. So I want to take this lady to that street. And while you are going, and the, you know, woman begins to talk. Oh, you are so nice and you are so gentle from where are you? And you say, well, I'm a Christian. And this woman, they have taught her, you know, all this, they have their techniques. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then you say, are you a Christian too? You better believe it. I'm a Christian also. And you are trapped. And then before you know what, you already are beginning to appreciate. And you are beginning to say, this kind of person. And this kind of person, it says, lost not utter a beauty. What seems to be beauty, what looks like beauty. Don't even desire it. Don't even lost after that in your own heart. It starts from the heart. 
let her not take you. Let her not trap you with her eyelids. You see, they put all these lashes and they put this one and they put this other one. And you know these people in your offices, especially, you know, you are, here you are, you are a manager or director. And maybe you have no choice. They have invited all these people and they have employed them. And these people will put something on the cheek here, something on the cheek here, eyelash here, and this other one here, and something on the finger, and the ear is this way, and all that. And the dress, you know, those tailors, the designers, they do it for a purpose. They will make, they'll cut the dress this way, and cut the dress that way. So if you look this direction, you see what you shouldn't see. If you look at the back, you see what you shouldn't see as well. And eventually, you know, this fellow is his secretary. And every time when, if somebody, you know, wants to do something, will come and trip a little and walk this way and miss that way. And then speak in a kind of a language, in a kind of English that we didn't learn in Nigeria. And after they have done that, your heart, something is jumping in your heart. And you are saying, well, but they said we shouldn't commit sin. They said we should prepare to get to the kingdom of God. They said Jesus can come at any time. Uh, but uh, well after all God is a merciful God after all if somebody commits sin God will forgive and uh, already there is something in your own heart that means that already you are going astray you see temptation comes to people and your places of work where you go you know the various temptations that come to you you know the various things that the people do that will lure you and entice you into evil and you know the reason why you have to be praying for salvation every Sunday why you go to the place of work, you have been enticed. You have been led astray. And you have been trapped in the evil, in the sin of the system. And when you come on Sunday, if they mention salvation, again you want to get saved. And then you go back to the place of work again because of the enticement, because of the temptation. Again you go back into that thing. You are never sure of your salvation. How can somebody be coming to a church like this? Five years and never be sure of salvation is because of what is happening outside there. It's because of what is going on outside there. If it were not because of what is going on outside there, we come in, we get saved, and we are saved. And you rejoice in that salvation. And you don't have to be coming back and in the night when you are having quiet time, God, I am sorry again. I'm sorry again. And then you go back to the place of work. You come back the following evening. Lord, I'm sorry again. What are you sorry for? What are you sorry for? You are nailing Christ to the cross afresh. And you say you are sorry. You never stop it. You are still, you are still driving that nail in the hands of Jesus Christ. Every night, every day. All the time coming back. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. I think the time will come when God will say, Don't come and say that here again. Go if you want to go into the world totally. You drive the nails in the hands of Jesus Christ, my only begotten son, by your sin, by yielding to temptation. And every time you come here to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When are you going to change? I believe the time of change has come. That during this retreat, we'll look up to God and we'll say, Lord, no matter the enticement and no matter the temptation, I am not going to yield to the devil. And you will not yield to the devil in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. I'm looking at it from verse 1. And, Sam, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Here again we are. And saw, and saw, and saw. Many of us who have not got married, here was Samson. A judge. Here was something. A person raised up of God. To bring judgment upon the Philistines. Afflicting the people of God. But then something saw the enemies of God. Enemies of his nation. Enemies of righteousness. And then said, I saw a woman in Timnath. I want you to think about this judge. Powerful judge. And the children of Israel... I'm sure you know that it's like in the church today. Whenever you see somebody that has the word of God, they, if you're a child of God yourself, there'll be an appreciation for somebody having the word of God. You, have, you see somebody that has the anointing of the spirit of God and the power of God, there'll be an appreciation in your heart for somebody having the spirit of God, the power of God. I'm sure that something, as a person that has the power of God, 
with all those women in the land of Israel, I'm sure it will not have been difficult for him to marry in Israel. But can you think about it? That Samson did not see any woman in Israel that pleased him. And you know there are people like that today in all this church with all the thousands and thousands of women that we have. And it has amazed me how God has blessed this church. And uh, you know in Lagos here alone, uh, it's, it's even difficult to have a single meeting for the women that are in this church. So many of them. But you know that as many as they are, there are some men, they cannot find a single woman in this church they can get married to. Because, you know, they don't like how these people, these women, they just dress ordinarily, without the jewelry, without the painting, without the mask, and without all the, all the evil things that the people have, and without all this, you know, this textile industry has gone mad. Textile industry in this present age and generation. If you see the kind of textile things they are producing, if you go to the market and see the kind of things they produce, and the kind of colorful things, and you know, some of them, you touch them, it will be like what we used to, what we used to have when you want to wrap Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas gift. And we'll be making sound like uh, it's not paper, it's not clothes. You say, what material is this? It will look as if they are put, uh, you know, this kind of uh, permanent, uh, eternal starch on it that you fold it, it cannot fold. I mean, different kinds of clothes today that people have. And different kinds of pictures. They draw the picture of animal, they draw the picture of idol, they draw the picture of a native land. They draw pictures, pictures, pictures. And they write a lot of things with, uh, you know, different kinds of colors. And then these uh, people, they say they are Christians, that is what they are looking at. But the sisters that dress normally to please the Lord, to obey the Bible, to follow the word of God, these men, they cannot find any woman to marry in this large church. I think we should even call the people of the world to come and judge. Let them come and let them see that this is only part of workers' retreat in Lagos alone. And let the sinners come to our midst and we tell all the sisters to stand up. Please, can you do me a favor? I like practical when I teach. Uh, you know, when I, when I was in school and they taught us teaching, uh, there was a time they gave us, they said we should do practical. And we went out to do practical. Let me do practical. Women, can you stand up? Here we are. Some men can't get anybody to marry. And all those people outside in the world, you can see now, sisters. God bless you. And God will continue to bless you. You see some brothers, all they are looking, I've seen a woman in Timnath. I've seen a woman in Timnath. I've, I've seen a woman in Timnath. There are 12 tribes in Israel. There are more than 120 districts in this Lagos church in Deep Alive. All those 120 districts and we have states and regions all over Nigeria. In fact, it's difficult to even count the number of women, the number of sisters in Deep Alive in this whole country. There are some brothers that the devil has blinded their eyes. They cannot see anybody to marry. And it's in a, in a village, dirty village somewhere that they will say, I saw somebody Zona leader, can you help me? I, I don't know what the church will say to this, but actually, when I was praying, and I had this dream, and I saw this uh, woman in our village, and I said, no, no, I'm a Christian. I must not marry a non-believer, but God told me that, no, that is my will. You are a deceiver. You are a deceiver. You are like something that will say, I saw a woman in Timnath with all the women in Israel. May God deliver us in Jesus' name. And then he said in verse 2, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Here we are. You see, there are people, they yield to the temptation. You see, temptation once again is an enticement. An enticement that will draw a person, draw the heart of a person unto evil. Eventually, you know, they cheated him. Because as he was planning the marriage, there's no time to read the whole story. If you go into the world to plan marriage, those people are going to cheat you. Yes, they will cheat you. And of course, you will not escape giving alcohol. You will not escape all the things they are going to be asking of you. 
at the end of the whole thing, when they have scraped your head, you will be disappointed. So this man was eventually disappointed. Of course, he got angry. What do you expect? And eventually, he, he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. Once you begin to look at those women in the world, you're not going to stop there if you, are, if you even get disappointment. And so eventually, he got one. And he, then, he got the one that destroyed him. Something powerful, mighty, with the Spirit of God. But those women in the world, oh, thank God for the church. You know, these uh, women in the church, they are not as clever as those women in the world. These women in the church, uh, if you say, I see the will of God, they run to coordinator, they run to, they run to marriage committee. And once the marriage committee threatens them and says, if you go that direction, if you marry an unbeliever, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Those people in the world, you try it, Delilah will teach you a lesson. And eventually, uh, Samson saw another one again. And went to this Delilah, this one now a harlot, a prostitute. And this woman began to say, you say you love me, why don't you tell me your secret? Why don't you tell me this? And Samson of all people began to tell lies. Began to tell lies. Remember, Samson was a judge in Israel. Somebody that should be in a particular mansion in Jerusalem. And all these other Israelites will be serving him as the leader of the whole nation. He was in a prostitute's room, house. And eventually when he, he told him, he told her the whole story. The woman said, come this time. He has told me all his heart. And they removed his hair and removed his power. And then said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he rose up, wanting to do like before. But the power had gone. The anointing had gone. And the beauty and the glory of God had gone. You know what happened? Let me read it to you. In Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. I'm reading to you from verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a woman for a man and and she caused him to shave up the seven locks of his hair stop there for a moment and let's talk together and now you men when you go to the barber's shop and the barber you see this uh, in this uh, world now there are modern equipments that they can use in removing your hair and it doesn't uh, feel painful at all. But I think that if they are cutting your ear, I don't think you will sleep. I think you will still be awake. Am I right? But here is a man. And you have been, we have been cutting the ear. You don't know how many times now. Maybe once in two months, once in three months. And you have done it so many times in life. And yet if somebody still cuts your ear now, you will know. This man has never, never, never had a single ear cut. So cutting air for him was a strange thing. And yet this Delilah made him to sleep and rubbed him to sleep so much that until they cut up everything, what had never happened, this man never woke up. What happened to this man? I mean, you see, these people of the world, I don't know what Delilah used, but these people of the world today, they can use anything on you. Once you take the first step, wants to show the interest in these women of the world wants to show the false interest they can use a familiar spirit they can use pills they can use anything and they can make something for you to drink that is not is not poison to poison you it just to make you lose your senses make you lose your alertness and once you get into it if you ever get delivered it will take the cross of jesus christ and so this man he slept. And the woman called a man and said, He is under my control. I have made him sleep that he cannot wake up. I mean, the man should have been afraid. What if I'm cutting his ear and this powerful man wakes up with the jawbone of an ass? He can kill you and me. He said, Don't worry, I've got him. I said, I got him. If the women of the world get you, you are gone. You know, we try to get you and discipline you and you we don't, we're not even able to do it properly. You argue with us. If they get you in the world, you will not escape. That's why you need to run away from temptation with all your strength. 
And eventually, when the air is cut off, look at what the Bible says in that verse 19. In the latter part of verse 19, and she began to afflict him. She began to afflict him. She began to afflict him. That is this ordinary woman. <laughs> Samson, of all people, with the power of God, his birth was prophesied by an angel.
excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. <laughs> I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just thank God for all his provision. I just blessed you with grace. 